so Peter, thank you so much <laughs> for being here uh, at this time in history. Uh, this is dramatic stuff, isn't it? And uh, thank you so much for, for, for agreeing for me to interview you. So if you can, I don't know if people are uh, aware of who you are and what you've done, but if you could just briefly say what, what you've been up to, uh, that'd be great. And then we'll take it on from there. Hey, Roger, thanks. And let me say it is truly the, the greatest pleasure for me to be able to talk to you and to be able to um, uh, give the best help and support I can to the uh, ex Great Extinction Rebellion movement. So it's really a great pleasure. Um, so uh, I'm an expert reviewer of the IPCC. Presently, I'm reviewing the uh, sixth assessment of the IPCC. And uh, uh, previously, I reviewed the um, the big um, uh, IPCC report of 2018, which had a huge impact. Suddenly, it had a huge impact on the world, the 1.5 degree C report, because it was following that that everybody suddenly clicked and realized, oh my gosh, we are in a climate emergency, in an unprecedented Earth emergency. We're in an emergency of our climate and an emergency of our oceans. This is not a big challenge, right? This is not um, one of many challenges. This is the challenge, right? This is the challenge for all, all of humanity. Just to explain briefly for the audience, because, you know, not everyone's quite well up on this whole international bureaucracy business. We, we so. have two um, um, intergovernmental international organizations which are supposed to respond to the climate emergency and are supposed to keep uh, atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases actually within a safe limit. So the, fir the first one is, is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which we call the UNFCCC. That was signed in 1992, ratified by all nations in 1993. Then we have the Climate Secretariat. And what they do, and now we are coming up to, this is hard to believe, the 26th annual conference of the parties to the UN convention. So um, uh, the whole process has come into, increasingly come into a process, not of responding to the climate emergency, but of delaying any response at all. Um, uh, this of course is largely due to the uh, influence of powerful big economy uh, countries, nations, and who uh, have worked for all these years to sabotage, in fact, these conferences. Yeah, well, this brings us to the sort of, yeah, the main point of our discussion, was, isn't it? Which is, what's happening in the real world? How bad is it? And why is it so much worse than a lot of people would like to believe? And, and I suppose it's worth saying, as I understand it, that there's been, what, 26 of these COPs, and during this period, broadly 30 years, you've seen a 60% increase in carbon right. uh, emissions. We're going to discuss this a little bit later, but I think one of the reasons Extinction Rebellion came into being is because people were all around the world were going, you know, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> these guys are supposed to be reducing this stuff and it's going up so something isn't working and we'll come on to discuss that but what I want to do before we do that is just have you just go through the state of play as you might say on what is happening with the climate and in the broadest sense because I, I know you you do work on the oceans and what have you the, the whole geophysical system what's going on why is it so much worse than most people most people think? And I'm interested, of course, because again, I do, you know, myself and other people in XR do these talks. And, you know, who, who's to believe me? I'm a, you know, at the end of the day, I'm an organic farmer. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I can do the maths. <laughs> but there's something powerful about it coming from, you know, a semi-insider, I suppose, as I think you would, might describe yourself, mm -hmm. um, to sort of say, no, this is this is the this is it right you know this is this is science it's objective there's probabilities but it's fundamentally x y and z 
Yeah, the uh, I've been calling it for some years the the terrible truth, and the terrible truth gets honestly more and more terrible. Um, but uh, clearly, we have a duty uh, to follow the great example of Extinction Rebellion and face up to the truth and act on the truth, act aggressively on the truth. Um, re recently, uh, thanks to the invitation um, to these interviews, I I've actually been looking into the Extinction Rebellion target of uh, getting to zero in a matter of years. And I just want to say that um, uh, I kind of surprised myself that this is not only the only right target, um, uh, it, it's the only target which, um, which gives us a chance, a fighting chance, the only target which gives our children uh, hope. And the, um, and the terrible data that I'm going to give you um, shows that um, it's a must. It's a must that the whole world aims for this target in a united and, and pretty aggressive way, right? So um, uh, we have a great United Nations Secretary General called Antonio Guterres. And for the past two years, he has been repeatedly making public statements in which he has told the truth about climate change science. Um, uh, his first statement, which received hardly any publicity, by the way, um, was uh, his famous statement that uh, climate change is an existential threat, uh, quote, to the survival of uh, life on Earth, particularly including humankind. So everything's accelerating, everything's at record high, in a nutshell, everything is getting worse faster. The global surface temperature increase for the first six months of this year, 2020, is 1.3 degrees C. Now, it is now generally acknowledged that two degrees C is out of the question catastrophe. So uh, the scientists have all switched and, uh, um, and I commend them for it. It's just been great to see how everybody has, um, has got together and agreed that the danger limit is 1.5 degrees C. Today we're at 1.3. A world at 1.5 degrees C is a disastrous world. No question. Uh, two degrees C is an impossible world. The scientists acknowledged earlier in the year that global surface heating is accelerating. Climate change is, catastrophic climate change is today. That's one of many reasons in general why Extinction Rebellion is right to put a target of zero in a matter of years. Absolutely right. Um, all of the other targets are wrong. None of the other targets are going to prevent global climate planetary catastrophe. They will not because the atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations are accelerating like never before. Uh, recent research just published a couple of weeks ago, atmospheric carbon dioxide is now the highest in 23 million years. That's insane. That's absolute climate crazy. Now we can go back 40, 50 million years, right? On carbon dioxide. Scientists, it's just amazing what they can do. Absolutely amazing. But we are increasing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere faster than in the past 40 million years. That is 100 to 200 times faster than happens naturally ending ice ages and bringing us into a warm period. It's now the survival of our children, not grandchildren anymore. We're looking at children the world over. And I stress, not just in the poor, vulnerable, uh, most vulnerable developing world. Oh, no, no, no. In the United States, definitely in Europe. 2020 is the year uh, all the scientists have been agreed on this for many years that at the absolute latest, global emissions must decline fast from 2020.
the world's leading expert on ocean heating, who took the trouble to work out um, how many Hiroshima bombs would need to be exploded to be equivalent to the amount of heat that we've added to the oceans. A few years ago, it was three Hiroshima bombs per second. It's now five Hiroshima bombs per second. And that's real. That is the real amount of energy that we're adding mostly to the oceans. And today, rather than responding on an emergency basis, rather than responding to Extinction Rebellion type targets, we're not decarbonizing. The rate of decarbonization has actually slowed in the past few years. So we're doing things worse instead of doing things better. The Arctic. Yes, the scientists have told us for years and years and years um, uh, that the Arctic's crucially important to the entire planet. What they've said is what happens to the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. That's now become a sort of famous statement. And uh, they've explained that if the Arctic sea ice melts away, then we're in big, big, big trouble because we're looking at hundreds of square miles of Arctic sea ice reflection cooling the Arctic and the Northern Hemisphere and the planet as a whole, we're looking at that switching from a cooling to a warming as the uh, open ocean is actually has the best or biggest capacity for absorbing heat on our planet. In 2016, the NOAA, the US National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, they publish an Arctic report card every year. In 2016, shocking, was not picked up by the media. They said with a long chapter with great illustrations that the Arctic permafrost warming, thawing and emitting had switched the Arctic from a carbon sink to a carbon source. So um, this is Earth catastrophe news. This is Earth catastrophe actual, not modeling, actual scientific finding today. Uh, we've lost the Great Barrier Reef. Um, that's been rather obvious for a few years. The uh, Great Barrier Reef suffered its third major bleaching in five years. Nothing like this has ever happened before to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, there are, we have two jewels on Earth, don't we? I think we sort of all know this. One on land, the Amazon, and the other tropical rainforest, but primarily the Amazon, and the jewel of the ocean. Uh, we've always regarded as the Great Barrier Reef, the biggest living organism on the planet, easily uh, viewable from space, and a wonderful example of how life helps each other and lives together in mutualism and thrives and produces this incredible, actually single organism of, the, of, of all of this coral. The Amazon, I track the Amazon fires in the Amazon fire season. I've been doing it for probably about six years now. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very visually easy thing to do, thanks to NASA. I was absolutely shocked to my core because just earlier this month, we had more fires in the Amazon than I've ever seen, like way, way, way more. And this is early in the Amazon fire season. And those fires, I look at them every couple of days now, they are now encroaching and swallowing up the entire Amazon. These fires, by the way, are, are, are intentional. Um, it's not just the Amazon, um, the biggest area of bright red fires that you see on the map is in Africa, is uh, sub-Saharan Africa where they burn every year all of the grasses. These fires produce massive amounts of carbon dioxide, but also a lot of methane, and also, of course, black carbon soot going up in the air. Um, the international community has to act so that People are not setting fires in the Amazon anymore. Uh, they have to make it economically viable, and this can be done, that the Amazon is left intact and not destroyed. 
that means as many people many many people have said for decades countless books and and papers we have to uh, change our economy fundamentally because we live under economy uh, under an economy which is inherently destructive of the entire planet it just needs to be said doesn't it what the overview is and one of the big problems is um, i'm sure many people are aware is you just get a scientist talking about a little a little bit over here or a little bit over there and um it's a bit like talking about a little bits of a body you need to know what's happening to the whole thing it's all connected <laughs> right? otherwise it's fairly illogical um and what you've done brilliantly is just you know lay out the top the top things that are going on the arctic the the methane permafrost situation the great barrier reef the forest fires and in the context of this this fundamental understanding which i think a lot of people haven't quite understood is once you've triggered this it it continues without you having to do anything that's that's my understanding of a feedback and so in principle like if you stop the whole thing's carrying on it's like you've started a, a an engine or something isn't it it's like it, it's on the go and i think that's this is the full horrific sort of realization and realistically speaking it's not like you can switch it off tomorrow anyway i mean you know a matter of years yes so we've still got a few years to you know even if everyone was totally with the program on it it's still going to take a few years to get down to zero so but just to make absolutely clear here, what we're looking at is having no human beings on the planet forever, right? That's what extinction means, is it not? That, I mean, that's what we're talking about. Do you, can you just confirm to everyone, as a scientist, that's what an existential threat means. It's not some abstract thing. It means there's no humans, and when there's no humans, there's going to be no humans for yeah, yeah, I mean, as, as um, uh, our UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said, you know, um, this, this is now an existential threat. That's a threat to our survival. That's what it is. Um, but you see, we're in the sixth extinction, right? And it's, it's accelerating at an unbelievable pace. It's almost certainly the most rapid extinction that the Earth has ever experienced. If we continue to emit, right? There's no question, no question about what's going to happen, right? The earth is going to get an intolerable place to live in um, with intolerable heat waves. But those heat waves won't just be intolerable. They will trash our crops because there's a definite limit of heat that crops can tolerate, even with irrigation. Um, there was a paper that got a lot of publicity um, year before last. And that was uh, what it, the media call the Hot House Earth paper that explained all of these feedbacks um, and described them as cascading feedbacks. Um, a, a good description is the domino effect. So you start one and they go on and on and on and on and on and then you just get more feedback. But um, they're actually all happening at the same time. I think there's two things we've established. Number one is if this carries on, there's going to be no humans left. The humans are going to die and that's going to be the end of the human race. That's point one. And point two seems to be the mechanism through which this happens is through a compounding effects of positive feedbacks. Lots of different things triggering themselves, triggering each other and then triggering themselves even more and even more. You know, let's just spend a few minutes just being honest with ourselves. But it's not like suddenly someone will click their fingers and the human race is going to disappear. As I see it, and maybe there's no words to adequately describe this, we're looking at the suffering and death of billions of human beings. This isn't like they just get up one morning and die, right? This is a slow death scenario for billions of people. And just explain it, if you, if you don't mind, like, you know, one or two of the mechanisms through which this mass, mass death happens. Yeah, mainly it's food and water, of course, right? Uh, global surface heating and climate change 
results causes multiple, multiple damaging adverse impacts on crops. Um, I mentioned the Amazon and I should also mention um, the shocking situation in Siberia because Siberia holds most of the world's permafrost. And we have unprecedented fires right across Siberia today. And those fires in Siberia are actually never going out. Uh, they're, in Russia, they're calling them zombie fires because they just subside, but they keep burning under the peat. And then when we get into the spring and summertime, and it's only been the springtime that's done this, whoosh, up they come again. And as I say, they're emitting vast amounts of carbon dioxide. So uh, that's one huge feedback. Any projection that you look at in terms of where global temperature is going to stop at, right? Whether it's 1.5 C, we're going to lose food production. And the latest models, they all show this. So in scientific terms, as I put it, all the accelerating data trends together result in a trend that the biosphere is in a state of collapse. Now that means that the human species, although there's a heck of a lot of us, and although we still live on a beautiful planet, um, that means that uh, nature is not going to support us. There's a specific mechanism, I think, here. I mean, obviously, you know, I've been a farmer for 20 years, and one of the things that I have difficulty communicating to people is to destroy a crop, you don't need to be at like 20 degrees centigrade or something higher than normal. You just need it to be 20 degrees higher than normal for like two weeks. Once you've killed a crop, it's like, you know, it's like human beings. Once the crop's gone, it's not coming back. And then if that's happening, you know, on the critical mass of different places, like I think it did about three years ago when food production was down 20% in the US, uh, Europe and Russia, wasn't it, or thereabouts, then if that continues for two or three years, you're literally going to run out of food. We, ha we have research, Roger, which, which has looked at the possibility of what they call multiple simultaneous breadbasket failure. And they yeah. say, yes, that's what we're heading for. And what that translates into everyday life is you go to the supermarket and there's no food. That's I mean, right. that's, that's the immediate reality we're talking. I mean, when you say the end of the human race, you know, it sounds a little bit science fiction in the abstract, but the, what you're basically saying is, is at some point in the next few years, you'll go to the supermarket and there's going to be no bread or there's going to be no yeah, yeah. I mean, it should be well recognized that the past 10,000 years, when we made our greatest invention ever, agriculture, right? The past 10,000 years has been most unusually stable with respect to the, to the climate, most unusual. And um, uh, all at the same time, and this is fascinating, in various parts of the world, agriculture was developed about 11,000 years ago. And then we've just got better and better and better at agriculture. Actually, we're, we're, we're now too good on agriculture. You know, agribusiness is, is, um, mm. it, it, it is not good. And we know and the research confirms that in all aspects, um, organic agriculture mixed with um, hedgerows, uh, woodlots, right, um, is, is the best form of agriculture. So we definitely do have to switch our agriculture because our modern agriculture is a huge emitter, a huge emitter of, of greenhouse gases. All of our energy and climate plans of all governments and corporations, right, are all for not only continued greenhouse gas emissions, but for continued increasing greenhouse gas emissions. So we're headed for a post-agricultural world we're changing the climate of the past 10,000 years into a completely different climate, which is not an agricultural climate. And when you say a post-agricultural world, what we're saying, again, to be blunt, is not enough food to feed people. That's right. And billions, and billions of people starving to death. That's right. We're looking at billions of people not able to survive because of starvation, water deprivation. And then of course you pile on the diseases. 
for many, many, many years, the infectious disease experts, we've just had an experience of it with COVID-19, have warned us that actually all of the infectious and communicable diseases are going to be increased by putting up the global temperature and lots of floods. It's, it's a recipe, um, it's a suicidal recipe and the only plans we have are plans for global suicide. As someone that's got more of a social science background, for me, like, there's also tipping points and positive feedbacks in social systems as well. That if you've got not enough food and you've got infectious diseases, then you're going to create social breakdown. Social breakdown mm -hmm. is going to reduce security. Security is going to make it more difficult to transport food to grow food, which is going to create more infectious disease, which is going to create more social breakdown. In other words, like all these things are interrelated, right? Yes. Uh, and they go exponential. It happens fast. It doesn't just gradually creep up on societies. Right. Once a society, yeah. you know, passes a certain point, then it all cascades downwards into chaos and slaughter and death. And that's what we're looking at. Yeah, we're now looking at what people call, you know, the unthinkable, but we can't afford not to think about it. Mm. So the great thing about Extinction Rebellion is Extinction Rebellion is challenging us to think about it and look at it. And it's bleak, yeah. it's grim, it's grim. It's very late in the day. Uh, the 2007 IPCC assessment stressed over and over and over that emissions had to be in decline by 2015 for a two degree C limit. We're years too late. So we really have to um, uh, um, give ourselves a good kick out the backside and really everybody has to take a hard look at this. No, I, I, I want to bring us on then to Something that you've been very vocal about and have been so impressed by because so many scientists, I mean, a lot of presentations would, would, would finish here, wouldn't they? <laughs> I've, oh, watched, yeah. I've, got, I've watched hundreds of presentations of the science and the science, you know, most of the time the scientists will say, so to summarize, we face an existential threat. A few of the scientists will actually go on and actually admit we're looking at the indescribable suffering and death of billions of people. And that's yeah. just starting to happen. Um, but no one hardly actually talks about the moral and political implications of, of what actually it means to knowingly and consciously, in full, in full view of the science, engage in a project that is going to lead to this much suffering. And I'd like you just to say, you know, you used to use this word evil and you used the word crime. Mm -hmm. Why have you used those words? Why do you think that's appropriate at this, at this point? It's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. It's actually a crime against all humanity, right? If we start calling it a crime as it is, I call it the crime of all time then at least we will switch the discussion to a level that people can actually understand, right? You know, uh, you could give people all these numbers, but they're just numbers. You can show people graphs, but they're just graphs, right? We are now, our business model, our perverse, irrational economics is destroying us. It's destroying the planet, uh, disrupting all the oceans, poisoning the oceans, the entire oceans with acidification, with heating, which disturbs and breaks down all the healthy ocean currents, and deoxygenation. This is evil. If you don't act against that evil, if you don't call that evil evil, you are complicit. And that's like an enormously powerful and emotional realization. Mm. And I think you're dead right, which is once you know, there's no escape from moral responsibility. You know, if, right. if people don't know about it, then they can't be responsible. Right. But everyone that's listened to this video, to be blunt, 
knows, and I'm sure many people that have listened, are listening to this video, have known for a while. And, you know, you come in and out of it, don't you? But what you're saying, and I think this is, you know, this is a transformative point, is, is there's no escape once you know in terms of deciding whether you're going to be complicit or whether you're going to name it and then act upon it. The most effective, definitely effective, immediately effective, readily doable action that everybody in the world can do is go vegan. In theory, we can all do that. If we do that, emissions drop immediately. So yeah, there's, there's the immediate thing. I want to mention now the, 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 the COVID lesson, the COVID example. Now, much has been written about the COVID experience, which has been an amazing worldwide experience. But to me, the big thing is that emissions dropped a huge amount and dropped fast. Yeah, and, and this comes back to responsibility, doesn't it? That it's not an act of nature to put this amount of carbon into the atmosphere. It's a political decision due to a political desire, a political program. And as being a political situation, it's changeable. It's, it's within our control. I mean, we've got, as you say, we've got the unavoidable social evidence of the last six months. When decision makers make the decision, they can reduce carbon emissions in a matter of weeks by 25%. Fact. There's no dispute about that. Which brings us back to the, the collective responsibility we have as human beings and as citizens to make sure this happens in order to not be complicit in the evil that right. is obviously in front of us. And as right. you've rightly said, there's enormous changes in our personal lifestyles that are now necessary. Let's not beat around the bush. They're necessary. It's necessary for people to become vegan. It's necessary for people to massively reduce their travel. It's necessary for people to review their lifestyles, their jobs, their careers, because we're facing the massive and indescribable suffering of billions of people if we don't, period, right? I mean, that, that seems unavoidable. I, I mean, I'd love to be able to avoid it, but I can't avoid that conclusion. I should make clear that um, uh, um, um, I've been a part of this evil myself, right? I, I mean, yeah. uh, I, I was a highly paid um, uh, person, right? Um, uh, big, fast cars, boats, the whole, I've been there, right? It's not a person who is evil, right? If you go in and study what, what it means, which, which you know, it's actually a result. Evil is a result, right? So this greatest evil, manifestly the greatest evil that we've ever seen, right? Is very simply the result of our energy production and our food production. It's really simple, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it's not only advantageous for all of us to survive, for our children to survive, for us to get those emissions into decline now in a matter of years, it's for our own health. Three to four million, um, the highest number I came across was four million people a year are killed from fossil fuels. The fossil fuel industry is killing four million people a year. I don't think anything you've said today is particularly different to what the scientists were predicting 30 years ago. Um, the, the only difference is we've actually got the hard data now, i.e. we can look at the real world and we can see it. So it's no longer a prediction, it's here as you rightly said. And I think, you know, just to move towards the end of our discussion, I think you've rightly said there's massive changes that are necessary in terms of people's lifestyles. And there's also massive changes in government policy that need to be changed. And as you know, Extinction Rebellion has been at the forefront of a fundamentally new message, which is, if a government doesn't change, it's your right, and as we've identified, your duty, if you're not going to be complicit, it to go into 
uh, rebellion and non-violent civil disobedience against the government in order to fundamentally reduce carbon emissions. It's not actually that complicated, is it? If you ask the average person who controls the economy, right? They know it's the banks, it's the big banks, right? And uh, we had uh, the, the, the banks, um, I think they did it pretty deliberately, you know, uh, 10 years ago, they pulled our chain and we had the most massive transfer of wealth that the world has ever seen, um, uh, the bank bailout, right? Uh, trillions and trillions of dollars. We're, we're seeing the same thing now um, with COVID and the banks have got to be behind it, right? If the banks wanted and decided that emissions have to decline from today, fast in a matter of years, the banks can do it, right? Because the banks hold the, the springs. All governments now are in a massive amount of national debt. We have an axis of evil, if you want. We have the big banking corporations, we have the big fossil fuel corporations, and we have the compliant governments. We are human beings. We all have compassion. None of us like to see other human beings suffering. None of us like that. You know, something I've been working on, you know, for the last two years is, it, is to try and make this argument, you know, here's the science, here's the moral responsibility, and here's you with your choices, you know. What are you going to do with your life? And I think, you know, to finish off, you put your finger on it that at the end of the day, we're talking about what's going to be happening to people we love, our children, our grandchildren, our relatives, the people in our communities. They're going to be starving at some point if we don't deal with this. This is not something abstract. It's not something in 2100. That's, it's in the next 10 or 20 years. It's a casino. No one knows who's going to be hit next. But what we do know is it's going to be exponentially worse, the casino that we're entering into. And it's a casino of death. It's a casino of massive suffering, unknown in the human experience. I yeah. mean, that, I, that, that's what you've been saying for the last hour or so. And for me, like, um, for Extinction Rebellion, you know, we have to do something with that agitation, don't we? That, you know, all the people that have got to this point in this video know, because that's why they're still watching this video. You know, most people, or many people switch it off after 10 minutes because it's like, I don't want to go there. But if you're at this point in the video, you know, and we know as Extinction Rebellion what we need to do which is to engage in civil disobedience, which is to break the law in order to uphold the higher moral law. Is there anything you want to say before we finish, Peter? Yeah, I just you have know, one final up. comment. I just have one final comment. Um, years ago, it was clear, it was, it was published in some magazines that we are, that the human race um, was at a crossroads, that we were looking at what was described as the worst, possible future or the best possible future. And that was absolutely right. It was described very well. We're not only um, robbing our children of a decent life, we're, we're robbing them of a, what I would call a golden age. Um, you don't have to have much imagination to think about a world in which there's no fossil fuel energy, no fossil fuel pollution, right? It's all clean, renewable energy. It's getting more, the more we use it. The more we use it, it's getting cheaper. The energy is available to everyone. Everyone on the planet can, you, can produce and use this energy. Plus, we're not um, slaughtering um, uh, billions of other animals and eating them. We're not doing that, right? Um, uh, we are growing the best nutritious, healthy plants. Now, of course, we have the industries that are making great, great products, real juicy, tasty products, right? Um, uh, for vegan, it's easy to be a vegan now. When I, when I started, it wasn't that easy. This world, which should be our human destiny, is a golden, glorious world. 
in which at the same time, because we're not polluting the planet, we're not poisoning the oceans anymore, the earth is recovering, the earth is replenishing, right? The earth is becoming uh, rich, rich, rich again, right? The earth can become as rich and as wonderful as when you and I, Roger, um, entered into this, uh, um, living on this fabulous, fabulous planet. Well, thank you so much, Peter. I mean, it feels like we've investigated the depths of the greatest horrors and the potential for the greatest good. I, I, I haven't, <laughs> words continually fail me when I talk about all this, so I don't know whether that sums it up. But uh, thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for the bravery of seeing it through to this point. And just to reiterate again, you know, action, action, action. There's no other way forward now to overcome our complicity in what's coming down the road. The details are at the bottom of this video if you're watching it on YouTube. And um, yes, thank you. Um, we're all going to get to it. Thank you, Roger. Thank you for everybody that's uh, managed to um, listen to us. Thank you. Thanks.